All right. Now, this is the challenge. The problem is that the civil rights movement, the, the people who, who claim to be the descendants of Martin Luther King, the people who claim to be fighting racism today in the black community and, the white, and, and among whites, the, generally, the, the people who are passionate about the issue of racism and advocating against it and leading the charge against racism, do not understand what racism is. Have never clearly defined it, certainly not in the terms that Martin Luther King did or that I did earlier. Those fighting against racism today are not striving towards colorblindness and indeed have not rejected the idea of race. Or if they have, have accepted the idea of race for now with some utopian vision of one day we'll understand a race doesn't exist. The critical race theory, the Black Lives Matter, the white fragility, the anti-racism movements that are out there today. Embrace collectivism. Embrace race. Embrace the differences between races and the fact that races should and must be treated differently. The whole idea of critical race theory is that you are determined by your race. The whole idea of white fragility is that by the very nature of being white, you are racist whether you are a racist or not, whether you act as a racist or not. And it's only through acknowledging that whether you accept racist ideas or not, you're racist just by the very fact that you're white and by being part of a system that is racist. Can you achieve virtue? The people fighting racism today, the people who claim to be fighting racism today, are the biggest racists in America today. If what you mean by racist is evaluating and judging somebody by the color of their skin, by their genes, by their membership in some ethnic group, then critical race theory is the essence of racism. It is a racist theory. White fragility is a racist idea that judges white people because they are white, not me, not you, but judges us as individuals, but judges us as a collective, as members of being white. What they hate, what they're fighting against is not racism. What the anti-racists really despise is America. And not just the racist history of America, which deserves to be hated and condemned. But they despise the nature of America, the freedom of America, the individualism of America, the capitalism of America. All those things that are actually truly anti-racist, truly embody a negation of racism. Those are the actual things that they hate. Those are the actual things that they despise. So, we all know, I think, all those listening to the show know, that the cure for racism is individualism, capitalism, freedom, the respect for individual rights, the limiting of the role of government to the protection of individual rights, equality before the law, the ideas on which this country was founded. These are all the ideas that these advocates supposedly who claim to be fighting against racism, these are all the ideas that they 
reject, that they don't want, that they think of and have labeled as systemic racism. Matt asked if Malachi was a socialist. Probably, or at least he was, you know, I don't know exactly how socialist he was, but he's definitely on the left when it comes to economic policy. Significantly on the left. Does that wipe out his virtues? I don't think so. I don't think so. It, it doesn't make him a saint. He was also quite religious, right? He was a preacher. He was a socialist religionist. And yet, he understood what racism was. Understood what the ideal, the, the, the anti-racist idea was far better than the intellectuals of today. And I think to call the intellectuals of today these so-called anti-racist socialists would be a compliment. They don't have an ideal for a different system. They don't have a vision for something better. What they want, what they hate is America. What they hate is capitalism. What they hate is the system of individual rights. They want to do away with that. In that sense, they're much more nihilistic. I don't think Martin Luther King was a nihilist. He was an idealist. He was a mistaken idealist, certainly in his socialism, but he was an idealist. And he had principles. He had ideas. He had things worth fighting for, and he risked his life to fight for them. What today's far left, what today's anti-racist, what today's the intellectuals behind BLM, not everybody who marched in BLM, the intellectuals behind BLM, the critical race theory, they're not building anything. They're not creating anything. They're not moving the world to a better place. They're not fighting for rights. They're not fighting for anything. What they want is to dismantle the existing system, not to replace it with something better. They can't imagine something better. All they want and all they argue for and all they talk about is doing away, destroying the existing system. I mean, according to this one author, who, what's her name? Barbara Smith, who was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize at some point. So she's a, she's a well-known civil right, rights activist, I guess. She says, and, and here you see the collectivism inherent in what they do. White supremacy is not merely the individual delusion of being superior. Notice the individual. White supremacy is not merely the individual delusion of being superior to black people. I thought that's exactly what white supremacy is. White supremacy is white people, individuals, thinking they're better than blacks because they're whites and those guys are blacks. That's literally what white supremacy means. But to her, it isn't. It's not merely that. She says institutionalized white supremacy does not need individual bigotry in order to function. So even if all of us, all of us, what literally colorblind, had not a racist bone in our body, treated everybody based on the content of their character, on their ability, on who and what they were as an individual, even then, she says, systemic racism would exist. It's, she says, a universal operating system that relies on entrenched patterns and practices to consistently disadvantage people of color and privilege white people. Now, how does this work? She, she never says. They never say. They never lay it out. They never give you concrete. How does this work without individuals being racist? How can the system be racist? How can, if individual policemen are not racist, how can the police be racist? Well, they say because the laws, the laws criminalize behavior that only blacks engage in and not whites. You know, and they usually bring up crack cocaine. Well, okay, well, well then fix the laws. 
If the laws, if those, then let's make a list of the 10 laws that need fixing and fix the laws. But that is because those laws exist because individuals were racist. Individuals wanted to punish blacks differently than they want to punish whites, which is racism. But if individuals are not racist, then they would never pass laws like that. And if there are laws entrenched in our country that still have those racist roots, then let's get rid of them. That's easy. But you see, to them, capitalism by its very nature, freedom by its very nature, Individuals choosing based on people's moral character. Individuals choosing based on people's ability. People getting compensated based on ability. People making wealth based on how much they produced. All of that is bigoted. All of that is wrong. All of that is immoral. And they have now adopted the language of racism in order to characterize all of that as immoral. Because they know the extent to which our culture has rejected racism. So what they're trying to do is package deal America with racism, package deal capitalism with racism, package deal, in a sense, freedom with racism, suddenly package deal individualism with racism. And if they can do that, then people will turn away from capitalism. People will turn away from individualism because they think, oh my God, I don't want to be a racist. And if individualism means racism, if capitalism means racism, I don't want to be an individualist and I don't want to be a racist. I don't want to be a capitalist. Now, whether they are doing this consciously or not is hard to tell. But this is what their nihilism is driving them to do. It's to associate anything they don't like with racism because they understand, and this is where it is conscious, they understand the power of racism, they understand the extent to which racism is viewed in our culture as evil and bad. And therefore they want to associate all the things they hate with the racism. She says, she writes, I mean this is just stunning. Our current version of policing is rooted in the slave patrols whose job was to capture people who had escaped to criminalize black bodies and to curtail black freedom. Now, as far as I know, our policing in the United States is very similar to policing in Europe, which is very similar to policing in, I don't know, almost every other country in the world. Countries that don't have the history of racism that the United States has, don't have the history of slavery that the United States has. And yet they still use the same policing tactics. Maybe policing is actually there to protect individual property. Maybe policing is there to protect individuals' lives. Japan policing is very similar to American policing. It's not dramatically different. And yes, way too many people are in prison. Way too many of those people are black. The fact that we've criminalized Nonviolent, victimless actions is a tragedy and a travesty and a massive injustice. Massive injustice. And maybe some of that is motivated by race. So let's fight for cr decriminalizing drugs or legalizing drugs. Not because Drug laws are racist, but because drug laws are unjust. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.
All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes but uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>